بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وعظيمنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحابه الغر الميامين الحمد لله الذي جعلنا من المتمسكين بولاية سيد ومولاي علي بن أبي طالب الله صل الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله أما بعد يقول الله في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الدين عند الله الإسلام The first of our salawat in honor of Rasulullah Muhammad صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم The second and one of Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib The third with your loudest voices In honor of the Imam of our time Imam Sahib al-Asri wal-Zaman Respected brothers and sisters Salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh can a non-Muslim enter heaven? A question on the lips of a number of Muslims in the world today. Do all non-Muslims go towards hell is an issue of some controversy within Islamic theology. And indeed, you find that such a discussion is a discussion which has theological, legal, as well as social connotations. On a theological level, Naturally, as a Muslim, you find that Muslims are of the belief that they are the ones who own heaven. And they are the ones who are guaranteed heaven. And that nobody will be in heaven except them. Because they'll look at a verse of the Holy Quran, for example, chapter 3, verse 19. In the Allah al-Islam, the religion with God is the religion of Islam. Therefore, you find that many Muslims will say that we are the people who will go to heaven, nobody else. If you're a non-Muslim, you will not make it to heaven. Whereas if you're a Muslim, the doors of heaven await you. Therefore, on a theological level, the discussion as to whether a non-Muslim can enter heaven becomes fundamental because we have to reflect upon ourselves. That is that heaven, a heaven that was created purely for us? Or are there others who may enter? That's on a theological level. On a legal level, a lot of our legal conclusions are based upon our understanding of other faiths. There are certain relationships which may be dictated legally if you're a Muslim or non-Muslim. How do you interact with one another? Are you allowed to marry one another? Are you allowed to eat of one another's food? These are, of course, important discussions. And the divisions can be seen between the monotheists and the polytheists and their different positions in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But no doubt on a social level, more importantly than anything else, when we live in a majority non-Muslim country like Canada, or if I live in a majority non-Muslim country like America, or I live, for example, in the United States or in Europe, in many of the countries of Europe which are majority non-Muslim, I come across some of the most wonderful people who are non-Muslims. I meet people from my days at school or at college or at work who do not believe in my prophet as such. They believe in all the prophets of God, but they may differ with me over their belief in Moses or Jesus or the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa alayhi Muhammad. These people may turn around and we may see them as the most moral of personalities. As in many times, You've been backstabbed by your own Muslim community, but the non-Muslim is the one who is loyal to you. You may work with a non-Muslim who is trustworthy, and you may have a Muslim who has taken everything with them. You may enter a business transaction with a non-Muslim and get every penny and more. 
Sometimes those of us who are lucky when we do the tax return, sometimes we're told that no, we actually owe you more than that. And then there is the Muslim who will tell you, no, you owe me a lot more than that. Therefore, you find that in our own social life, we find that there are non-Muslims who are the best human beings. Human beings of a truthful nature, human beings of humility, human beings who don't gossip, human beings who try and support one another. When I see these non-Muslims, I ask myself a question. Surely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who says that of his attributes, he is Rahman and Rahim. Allah is the all-beneficent, the all-merciful. Surely Jannah is vast enough, not just for the followers of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa but also for the followers of others. There are others who believe in Jesus, others who believe in Moses, others who, for example, believe in Krishna, others who may believe in Buddha. These are all men of wisdom. In some cases, some have the belief, not all, but some have the belief that these are men of God. Now, if a person, for example, lives in India and never interacted at a certain part of history with any Muslims, all they knew was what? All they knew was about the Hindu faith. They never had a man mentioned to them about Rasulullah. Or if someone lives in the Amazon rainforest, let's say a certain period of their life, Never did they know about Karbala or about Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. Many of us may travel to certain parts of the world. You know that when you're in that village, there's no one in that village who has ever heard of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. So let's face the facts that you're in a village where you may have heard about Imam al Hussein. Your average Joe in that village will turn around to you and say that I haven't heard about this. Will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punish somebody? Where the proof of Allah did not reach them? Isn't it unfair and unjust? Isn't it also unjust when you look at some of them and the philanthropic work that they do? The charitable work that they do? Are you telling me Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not open the doors of heaven to people who were willing to look after those who were poverty stricken? Those who were elderly? Those who for example were homeless? You're telling me that my Allah is an Allah who closed the doors of heaven for people like this? Shaheen Mutahari, may Allah bless his soul, looked at one particular story that happened in Iran over 45 years ago. He says in Iran, there were a group of people who were lepers, you know, those affected by leprosy. In the Quran, Allah mentions from the time of Prophet Jesus, السلام, there were people who were lepers. Now, you know very well in the Quran, Allah mentions them. He mentions Al-Akmah wal Abras. Yes, Al-Abras is the leper. Al-Akmah are the blind. The word blind in Arabic has two meanings, either A'ma or Akmah. Akmah is someone who is only physically blind. A'ma can be physically and spiritually. Yes. Al-A'ma may be someone who cannot see with these eyes, but also the eyes of the heart are the biggest eyes you want to see with. I'd rather have inside, basira, rather than outside, yes? But then you have in the Quran, Allah mentions the leper. The leper were a community in the time of Christ. Christ himself would cure the leper. Christ himself would go to them. Mutahari mentions that in Iran, there was a period when the lepers were there. These lepers had no one to come and look after them. We asked all the Muslim community, we said to them, surely one of you who claims to be the people of God, you are awliya Allah, you are the first of God's chosen ones. One of you come and cure the leper, come and sit with the leper, help the leper, feed the leper. None of them would want to dirty their hands, their holy hands with the leper. He said we had French nuns who came to Iran and they were the ones who carried the lepers. Those French nuns do not believe in my prophet. They may not even know about Karbala for all I know. But they live more like Zainab than many of us do. Yes. They live more like Fatima and Zainab and the ladies of Al-Muhammad. Are you telling me that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to tell that nun on the day of judgment because you did not believe in the Quran, hellfire awaits you? Further than that, when you see someone like Mother Teresa, for example, Mother Teresa, the amount of work she did with orphans and the homeless and the poor in Calcutta and in India, she dedicated her life to serving. Today in our communities, when you ask someone to serve the community, say, honestly, I don't have time. Three hours later, he's playing football for two hours, clean. But when you tell him, come and serve the community, I don't have time. But when you want to have a smoke, we can sit for four hours, clean. But say, I don't have time to serve the community. You know, I'm really busy. 
But when they want to chill, they can all find time to chill. Mother Teresa takes her whole life to come and serve humanity. She's not a Muslim, but am I certain that someone like her who's a non-Muslim, Allah will condemn to hellfire. Many times you'll find in India, there are women who are Hindu. They look after women who have been sexually abused as kids. You'll find in Thailand that there are people who look after children who have been the victims of pedophilia. Yes. Are these people surely not going to be alongside the messenger of God on the day of judgment because of their acts? Further than that, the issue becomes more important because today in Canada, there are many Muslims who married reverts whose parents are still not Muslim. When a person reverts to the religion of Islam, their parents may still be Christian, they may be Sikh, they may be Hindu, they may even be atheist. When they are of these beliefs, that person naturally has a problem. Why? Because every lecturer comes and says, heaven is for the Muslim, everywhere else everybody can burn. How many years did you grow up with majalis? Burn, burn, burn. And that everybody burns, you find that that person there will turn around, there is a soft spot in their heart still for their mother and father, yes? In the same way the mother and father were hurt when that person may have converted to the religion of Islam. It's not easy for the whole community to find out that your child left the religion. Likewise, you find that it's not easy for that girl in every lecture to hear that anyone who is a Muslim will go to Jannah and whoever's not a Muslim will go towards Jahannam. Further than that, when we talk of heaven and hell, we talk about it very generically, very black and white, as if there's one gate called Jannah, and there's one gate called Jahannam. Yes, you open a gate, you're in. You open a gate, you're in. I know for certain that me and Ali ibn Abi Talib will be nowhere near each other in Jannah. I can assure you this from now. I'll be fortunate if I catch a glimpse of Amir al-Mu'mineen. But I know for sure there are levels to heaven, as well as levels to hell. I know for certain that if you make it to hell, there's always going to be a couple who are way below you. Shaitan from the ins and shaitan from the jinn. There are shayateen from the jinn. Yes. And there's a few shayateen from the ins. Those ones, they'll make it at the bottom. But there's no doubt that the levels of Jannah are a few levels. And the levels of Jahannam are a few levels. Now, why would God put the levels of heaven and hell? Why not just make one rosy garden for all of us to drink that halal wine? And for us, and you know you're all looking forward to that more than any. But for those of you who have drunk already, there's quite a hot drink waiting for you. You find that, unless of course Toba is there, you find that in the levels of heaven or the levels of hell, there are levels. So sure, is there a question where maybe someone who is not a Muslim, is there a possibility of the lowest levels of heaven or the lowest levels of hell, that's another question mark, which a person has to ask. Further than that, what if a person, the Islam they were introduced to was the Islam of ISIS? Yes. Imagine, I'm living in the time of Imam al-Sadiq. I'm fortunate, my eyes open to Imam al-Sadiq. I'm lucky. What if my eyes open to Baghdadi and the rest of the riffraff? Yes? As if my eyes open to the nonsense filth, people like that, and the rest who adore such people, and the rest who make excuses publicly, and privately for such people, yes, do not worry, their colors all came out in the last few years. As to the one who loves such people but cannot admit it publicly, you find that what if the Islam that I first met was the Islam of Abu Bakr Baghdadi? Ya Allah, is it fair that that Christian's first Islam that they came across on this earth was the Islam of Abu Bakr Baghdadi? Because those who managed to see the eyes of Rasulullah those people, surely it's unjust that they can see the glory of Rasulullah. But I have to wake up to Abu Bakr, al-Baghdadi and others of that ilk. When I look at that, therefore, you find that the questions are many on this issue. And sadly, many of them have not been answered with the depth they deserve. Many times, it's just been a case of Muslim heaven, non-Muslim hell, and that's the end of the story. And there's no way... A Lord of Islam would make it as simple as that. Therefore, tonight, let's examine this question to see were the Ahlul Bayt السلام, that narrow that they only wanted heaven for those who were Muslim? Or was there a case that on the 10th of Muharram, Imam al Hussein السلام, showed that there are certain instances where you may not be on the path of Islam, 
But you're more than welcome to come and join if your principles are the same as the religion of Islam. I'd like to dissect this in the following stages. Number one, how important is it that the worldview that we have is not binary heaven or hell? And what happens to a person whose worship is purely heaven or hell? Number two, how important is it that we don't see ourselves as the chosen people of God? And how important was that in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi Number three, how important is the intention behind the action? If publicly I am giving the poor, how important is my intention behind helping the poor? And who's the only one who can judge the intention? Number four, according to the Holy Prophet, were there levels and doors of Jahannam and Jannah? And is there a case that a non-Muslim who was a good human being may have their punishment lightened? but may still receive their rizq from Jannah even though they are not in Jannah. Number five, how did Ali ibn Abi Talib show on the day of Safin that the generations of the free are the ones we admire? He does not have to be a Muslim for him to be admired. Number six, if a person argues that Allah in the Quran says that I guide who I want to guide and I misguide who I want to misguide, how do we answer that? Number seven, how did the 10th of Muharram highlight for all of us in a few of its statements that the door of Islam was not an end, rather it was a means for the freedom of humanity. Let's examine that and dissect the topic in complete depth. When we look at the binary vision of the Muslims in the world today, when you speak to many of them, our language is mainly in terms of heaven or hell. When I grew up, many of the acts that I performed were basically because of heaven or hell. As in if I was to pray, the reason I was praying was either because I was scared of my mother's slipper or because of the fact that I recognize that if I don't pray, for example, hell awaits me. Yes. As in how many of us in this room, when we've come to pray, it's not because we love salah. Many of us, if we had a chance, would never wake up for fajr if it was the last thing we did. Yes. I wake up in the middle of the night. And all of it's why I have to wake up to say thank you for five minutes, okay. And then after that, what is it? There's hellfire that awaits me. You know what? I might as well do it. That vision of heaven and hell is a good vision in its basic form. The Quran mentions heaven and hell numerous occasions. The Quran does not shy away from discussing heaven and hell. But the Quran says evolve as a human being. Don't stick on heaven and hell alone. You as a human being, if heaven and hell are your priorities, You've not then recognized why Allah made you his representative on the earth. You as a human being can reach levels higher than the angels. But what you don't realize is that the acts of worship we've given you is because we want to culture you that you don't become lower than an animal. Yes. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told me to pray five times a day, my evolution, how did it begin? It began with fear of hell. You know what? I'm going to pray. I'm scared of hell. I then moved on to a second level, which was what? That I want heaven. I see those verses in the Quran that I'm going to be chilling in heaven. I want that. That level of development is good, but I've not appreciated salah. As in when I look at salah and its origin, the way Ali ibn Abi Talib describes salah, I realize this is a wonderful disciplining of the human being. Number one, I'm humbled in my salah. Me, the arrogant human being, will not bow down with this head on the ground to any of you. No way. You, I may love you so much, you're not going to get my forehead on the ground. At most, I might go like that to you. I'm not going to put my forehead on the ground. When God told me to put my forehead on the ground, firstly, he was humbling me. Don't walk around on this earth arrogant. Ali ibn Abi Talib says, mankind, you came from a drop of semen and you leave as a piece of dust. You don't know when you came. You don't know when you're going. So why do you walk around like you know everything? Yes. When you as a human being go down in sujood, it's wonderful because it humbles you. And it reminds you, you came from that clay. You'll return to that clay. So get ready for that world. Secondly, it gives me punctuality. Thirdly, it allows me to recognize being thankful to Allah for everything he gave me. I can never be grateful to Allah enough. My parents, there are others who are orphans. My eyes, there are others who are blind. My ears, there are others who are deaf and dumb. Uh, my feet, there are others who cannot walk. How can I not be grateful to Allah for what he's given me? Now look at the evolution of my worship. Instead of my salah being heaven or hell, my salah becomes how Ali ibn Abi Talib describes it wonderfully. 
Imam, what does he say? I don't worship you, God, out of fear of hell, for that's the worship of a slave. Nor do I worship you because I want heaven. That's the worship of a businessman. I worship you because I found you worthy of being worshipped. That's the worship of a free human being. Allah, yes? The worship of a free human being is that the human being does not put the world in heaven and hell. As he says himself, if you put me at the bottom of hell, I'd still call out my love for you. Because hell is your creation. And every creation of yours has mercy surrounding it. So even there'll be mercy for me over there. Yes? As in subhanallah, even when you look at hell, it's still a creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore Allah's rahmah overtakes everything. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib highlighted to the Muslim, your identity shouldn't be the religion. The religion was a means for your freedom as a human being. The religious act like fasting, don't do it because mommy and daddy are keeping an eye out on you. Wallah, I've seen some people when they fast, what's their intention of fasting? Yes, you look at him in iftar, it's not food he's put there, he put a mountain. Yes, you're looking at him, you're thinking, Habibi, do you know what you are doing there? Sayyidina, listen, I'm fasting because my parents get really angry if I don't fast. So that's the only reason I'm doing it. And between me and you, we've had a couple of sips of water during the day no one knows about. Yes? <laughs> you find that some people, what have they done? They put the mountain of food there. You fasted, so you give the stomach a rest or you give the stomach a problem. Secondly, when you're fasting, you're doing it because of fear of hell. Or you're doing it because you want heaven. Put heaven and hell on the side. Do it to become a disciplined human being. That I am not an animal. I am someone who's able to discipline myself. I watch my eating. I watch my habits. I've got a lecture coming up, inshallah, on the archetypal GQ Shia very soon. What is it that makes the true follower of Al Muhammad physically, not just spiritually? We'll examine that and we'll see the eating habits of our communities, inshallah. You find that therefore, when Muslims put heaven and hell, what then happened? Your judgmentalism comes out. How? Because when I see the word of heaven are those with a beard, mashallah. And those with he uh, who have a tasbih in their hand. And those who dress religiously. I look at them, I say, these are the people of Jannah. When I look at someone who doesn't have a beard, or someone doesn't dress in a manner which looks like they've come from, for example, the Middle Eastern background, I'll turn around and say, those are the people of hell. Do I look at the heart of the human being? Not at all. No, who cares about heart? Let the heart die. The main thing is the exterior of the human being. Yes. If he has tattoos, that means he's not a religious human being. And if he has a beard, that means he's a religious human being. And mashallah, those with a long beard and how many knives they stab you in the back. Yes. How many of them? The beard, mashallah, is long. But he's a walking machine of envy on this earth. He sits on the member of Al Muhammad, telling you about how you should be united and don't be hypocrites. And he himself is a moving machine of stabbing in the back. Yes, as much as he can. Such a person is the exterior. Why? Because my vision of the world wasn't, is he a free human being? Is he someone who looks at the world, makes excuses for people, thinks of the benefits and the positives of the human being? No. I only look at the exterior of the human being. That person is heaven. That's, that's why in our communities, when you want to describe someone who's religious, what do you say? He fasts and he prays. You don't say he's got good akhlaq. Is he a namazi? Is he a musalli? Yes. Does he fast? Yes, that's a religious person. Habibi, his heart, how is it? How is his heart? I don't care about his heart. His akhlaq is good. Who cares? When he walks into the mosque, I see a tasbih. I remember Bahlul was not allowed to enter Harun al-Rashid's court. Why? Because it was a gathering for Maulanas only. Because you know, Maulanas are the most religious people in the community. When Bahlul was about to enter, the narration mentions that the God said to me, content. I said, why? He said, Maulana only allowed. Bahlul cleverly, what did he do? He went and bought a turban and he got a tasbih. When he came, they said, tomorrow Maulana, sir, please welcome, enter. He's like, am I invited? He said, of course, all of you are invited. He said, very well. He took off the turban, gave it to him. Took off the tasbih, gave it to him. He said, these two are invited, not me, the human being. Yes. These two, go and put them in the gathering because you're more concerned about what? This is the conclusion. You're concerned about putting people in hell. Try and think about putting yourself in heaven first. Isn't that true? 
I turn around to the world. That one's going to heaven. That one's going to hell. That one's going to heaven. That one's going to hell. The worst act a Muslim can have is where they believe they are the chosen people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes? For a Muslim to turn around and say that I am the one who's going to Jannah. Everyone else going to Jannah. You forgot the virus that affected the children of Israel before us, the Quran mentions. When the children of Israel had reached a stage where they said, we are the chosen people of Allah. And wallah, they have the audacity in the Quran. There's one eye in the Quran, audacious. You know what they say? And even if he puts us in hell, it's only a matter of a few days that we're in hell. How many times do you hear Muslims who say this? That even if I go to Jahannam, what? Allah says everyone goes to Jannah eventually. So if I go to Jahannam, I'll go for a few days only. And that will be it. The problem is, if day of judgment is 50,000 years, I don't know what Jahannam's few days are, in all honesty. Someone said to me, Sayyidina, are you telling me that that day of judgment is that long? I'm like, Habib, if we calculate how many humans have lived on this earth, logically it's going to be a long day. And if your projector screen is a projector screen, which has got quite a long film, that's going to be an even longer day. For a Muslim to turn around and say, I'm the only one. I remember when Uthman bin Mad'un, Imam Ali named his son Uthman. Imam Ali has a son called Uthman. Many times on YouTube they say, look, Ali ibn Talib names his son Uthman, therefore and therefore. I reply by saying Imam Ali named his son Uthman after Uthman bin Mad'un. Uthman bin Mad'un, in the days of Jahiliyyah, he was, you know, like anyone else. They weren't Muslims. But he never drank alcohol, never committed shirk. Never committed zina. Narrations mention that this Uthman, Imam named his son Uthman after him. Because you know, Umm al-Banin, the mother of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, she has four sons who died on the 10th of Muharram. Abbas, Ja'far, Abdullah, and Uthman. That's the four sons, the three brothers of Abu al-Fadl. Imam Ali named his son Uthman after him because he said this great human being, before Islam came, he was living like a Muslim. He wasn't called a Muslim, but he was living like a Muslim. When he died, his wife came near his grave. She said, Hani and Lakal Jannah. I congratulate you, Jannah awaits you. Rasulullah turned around to her and he said, How are you so certain he's going to Jannah? Yes. She said, But Ya Rasulullah, you praised him, everyone praised him. He said, A Muslim should not reach that stage where they say that Jannah awaits such and such. If the Prophet has said someone's in Jannah, automatic. Ahlul Bayt have said someone's in Jahannam, automatic. For they are the representatives of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But for me to come and say that Jannah awaits me or that that person is definitely in Jahannam, the children of Israel were saying this to Allah. Then the Christians later, that all we need to do is love Christ and Jannah awaits us. Subhanallah, the Shia are similar in some cases in our communities. If I pack the mosque in Muharram, I turn up for 10 nights in Muharram, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will guarantee me Jannah. No. On the contrary, when I come in Muharram, Muharram is the kickstart for me to continue my education, to serve the community, to serve the creation. If a person comes for Imam al Hussein salam, thinking Imam al Hussein guarantees me Jannah, Imam will turn around one day and say, How about Imam al Jawad? Was he smaller than me that you never came to his lecture at the mosque? Imam al Hadi, why did you not come to the lecture in the mosque and the mosque was empty? Imam al-Askari, do you know when his shahada was or not? Ahl al-Bayt did not want us to fall in the trap where I'm in Jannah, everybody else in Jahannam. No, they wanted us to say, Ya Allah, Alhamdulillah alladhi hadana lihada. Wa ma kunna linahtadiya lawla an hadana Allah. I praise Allah who guided me to where I am and I would not be guided except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's it. And to further say, ihdina sarat al-mustaqeem. Why? Because there was a principle they applied. You do not know the intentions of a person behind their actions. And the only one who knows the heart of the human behind an action is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mother Teresa, when I see her die, when she dies, I don't know Mother Teresa what she uttered in her last breaths. I don't know Mother Teresa before she died. I don't know, maybe in her own private life, maybe she had made certain decisions. Maybe there was a way of theology she wanted to adopt. Today, if a Muslim says Mother Teresa will not go to Jannah, why? Because Mother Teresa did not accept Rasulullah. Who told you Mother Teresa didn't accept Rasulullah? And even if she didn't accept Rasulullah, what do you know about the intentions behind her actions? Yes. In our own community as well, a person can serve the community, maybe to show off. 
A person can pray, but maybe those prayers are done simply in a humble way so everybody thinks they're religious. Ahlul Bayt said, do not fall into that trap. That because you see someone, you judge their intention positively or negatively. And that's why you find with the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, many times he was asked the question, Ya Rasulullah, a non-Muslim who's a good human being, that person goes towards hellfire. When you look at Alam al-Majlisi and look at works like Thawab al-A'mal, you find that this question would be asked repetitively to the Ahlul Bayt salam. Why? Like me in Canada, when I come to the airport and I see wonderful morals, when I go to work and I see people who are trustworthy, people who are kind, I wonder to myself, Ya Allah, my neighbor, and truly when I was younger, my neighbor, the best akhlaq you'll ever find, yes? My neighbor would be the type, we were a young Muslim family, and you'll find that my parents did not necessarily know the language as well as anybody else in the street. We'll help you with your car. We'll help you with your house. Ya Allah, that person, hellfire awaits them. Surely, Ya Allah, you would not put such a person in hellfire. You found that Rasulullah and the Ahlul Bayt were asked this question on many occasions. When they were asked these questions, what did they say? I remember Ali bin Yaqteen narrates from our seventh Imam that one day a person asked Imam Al-Kadhim, the non-Muslim automatically goes and burns in hell. Imam Al-Kadhim replied, let me tell you a story. There was a non-Muslim who was a good human being and he was the best of neighbors. He died as a non-Muslim. He did not accept the message of Rasulullah. And the message had come to him. You see, there are those the message doesn't come to. The message had come to him. He didn't accept the message of the messenger of his time. You find that that person, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because they were a good human, decides to build for them a house which is neither in Jannah nor will taste the flames of Jahannam. Ya Allah, I thought there's only Jannah and Jahannam. There's only heaven and hell. No, it seems that between heaven and hell, there are certain places, and only Allah knows those places, where Imam al kadhim says that Allah created them, a house of mud for the non-Muslim who's a good human being, who may have not accepted Islam, but never oppressed, listen to the word, never did zulm against another human being. Notice Ahl al-Bayt. You could do many things, but if you're not a zalim, the door of salvation is always open for you. The zalim, the door closes. But they said at that moment that that person, because he's a good human being, but he's not a Muslim, does not matter. Allah creates a certain space for those people who are not Muslims, but good human beings. Allah makes sure that the fire of hell does not burn them. They may not receive the same blessings as the people of Jannah. Again, it comes to that idea of the levels of Jannah. But that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ensures that the rizq reaches them. Where does the rizq come from? Imam al kadhim replied, the rizq comes from where Allah wills. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decides that there are certain areas where their sustenance continues. That's number one. Someone came to Imam al-Baqir. Now listen to this. Said Imam in the Quran, Allah says, the mushrik, the polytheist, shirk is the only sin that cannot be forgiven on the day of judgment. Which one? Shirk. Any other sin can be forgiven on the day of judgment. Theft, adultery, lying, so on, can be forgiven. But, but idolatry, giving partners to Allah, cannot be forgiven. The person came to Imam al-Baqir, said to him, I know someone who's a mushrik, but a wonderful human being. Imam al-Baqir looked at him. He said in the time of the children of Israel, there were a group of believers who were being oppressed. They went towards the house of someone who was a good human being, but a mushrik. That person, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed about him. That because he was a good human, even though he was a mushrik, if the mushrik was allowed to enter heaven, then I would open a door of heaven for them. But even though he cannot enter heaven, I have ordered my angels. That I don't want the flames of Jahannam to hurt this person. He may not receive the blessings of the people of Jannah, but neither will he be burnt like others in Jahannam. Because now Imam al-Baqir is showing Jahannam is not as clear cut as people see. People imagine Jahannam that you're thrown straight in, burnt, finished, roasted. Others do not realize that the Ahl al-Bayt mention that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he sees a human who's free, free, what do I mean? I don't believe in your religion. I don't believe in your God. 
But I agree with you on the principles that you have to stand up against injustice. That's freedom. That I agree with you that when I see tyranny, you must stand up against all forms of tyranny. That's a free human being. We call such a person, a person who has freedom in their life. Then Rasulullah is asked the question, Ya Rasulullah, Jahannam, if there's someone Allah is going to put in hell, can you ask for them not to be burnt in hell? That's unusual. What do you mean not to be burnt in hell? Rasulullah replied, Abdullah bin Jad'an. Listen to what he says. Abdullah, the son of Jad'an. What is a person I have prayed to Allah that although he did not take me as his prophet, Ya Allah. But because of one thing I have prayed to Allah that Abdullah bin Jad'an does not get burnt in Jahannam. Ya Allah. Or his burning is much less than those who have done far worse than him. He said, what is it Ya Rasulullah? Listen to what he says. He used to go out and give food to the poor. Subhanallah. Someone out there today in the soup kitchen, you're telling me that that person in the soup kitchen, just because he doesn't believe in the way I believe, that person goes to Jahannam and is meant to be burnt with the likes of nonsense and nonsense, yes? As in that person is meant to be burnt with these people, that person, Rasulullah, you know what he said about him? He said, إِنَّهُ كَانَ يُطْعِمُ الطَّعَامِ Ya Rasulullah, look at this wonderful line. He used to give food to the poor. Look how great it is. That a human being, when they give food to the poor, in the eyes of Allah, Allah does not look at that human and say, you didn't pray five times a day, so I'm going to burn you now. Go in there, you're going to be burnt. No. You would go out in the middle of the night. Ahlul Bayt used to love this trait in the human being. That when the human would see the poor, they would try their hardest to make sure that that poor person was looked after. Rasulullah again says, a person who was found looking after a dog that was ill or a dog that was injured, that person came and gave water to that dog. Jannah awaits him for that small act. Yes. You see a dog and that dog is in trouble. Of course, it's not an excuse for you now to go out and all buy dogs. I see the Muslim community today, every single one of them is sending me an email. I want to buy a dog, I want to buy a dog. Ashab al-Kahf have a dog, mashallah. Since when did you use Ashab al-Kahf as your example? Yes. Today, all of a sudden, the dog which saved Ashab al-Kahf is now the hero of the religion of Islam. Yes. That dog saved, the, that dog, like Imam al-Sadiq says, a dog is there for security. Allah created it. Or a dog is there to shepherd. Or a dog, for example, is there to help the human being who may not be able to see. But further than that, you know, the hugging and kissing and the licking and all of these things. Inshallah, you know. People learn from these things, inshallah, and develop. You find that therefore, Rasulullah looked that that person helped a dog. That dog in our country is the Middle East. The dog, if it sees a human being, it runs away. Because in the Middle East, I don't know what the people are. Wallah, I don't know. Like some people, there's a real barbarity to them. A dog runs from a human. As in there are times you go to a park, you're worried about that dog running towards you, the one looking at you. In the Middle East, the dog runs away from the human being. Because the human, subhanallah, this is something saddening. The human being hits the dog. The human being, this is disgusting upbringing. Wallah, some people, their upbringing leaves a lot to be desired. Rasulullah looked, he knew from that time, he knew the Arabs are a barbaric bunch. And so what he did, he said, that anyone, that person, Jannah awaits, Ya Rasulullah, didn't pray, didn't fast. No, Jannah awaits for that act. Why? Because that one is a free human. Allah loves the free human being. Allah loves the one who on this earth, when they see dhulm, they don't remain silent upon that dhulm. Rather, they're ready to speak out against that moment of injustice. Someone asked, if someone was in the Amazon rainforest, they'd never heard of Rasulullah, never heard of the Quran, never heard of Karbala. They come on the day of judgment. Surely that person, what can they do? Then their test is not to believe in Ashadu Anna Muhammad and Rasulullah. Their only test is to say Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. That's it. Nothing more. How dare we say that they have to believe in Muhammad and Rasulullah when the reality is that the truth has not come to them. Allah does not punish a people who the hujjah has come, not come to. Yes? It is unjust that that person is told, say they lived 60 years ago, 70 years ago, forget internet today and so on. 60 years ago, 70 years ago. That person, it's unjust that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would say to them, say, Ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. They said, we never heard about Muhammad. There were no Muslims in our area. Then their test is not Rasulullah. Their test is to believe in La ilaha illallah. That's it. 
Anyone who's been to the Amazon will tell you, if you want to believe in Allah, there's no more tranquil a place than there. Yes. The beauty of nature can all be seen there. You cannot tell me that came by an accident. Please don't tell me that that was an accident. But that's the human when they live in the same place and don't travel and don't see Allah's wonders. Then they reach a stage either because they hate the people of religion. They say there's no God. Or because they themselves are so narrow, they're not willing to admit the beauty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation. Someone says, okay, what if for example, someone's parents are Muslim, but they're Muslim. Are you going to come back to your parents and tell them you're going to hell? Wallah, the beauty of Allah's mercy. How merciful a Lord we have, subhanallah. That Allah says, you can intercede for your parents on the day of judgment. Yes. And how do you intercede for your parents? Those who memorize verses from the Quran, Allah allows them to intercede for their parents. Those who die as a shaheed, Allah allows them to intercede for their parents. Those who, for example, are amongst the truthful, Allah allows them to intercede. I remember a man coming to Imam Amir al and saying to him, Your father, Abu Talib, will burn in hell. So he said to him, yes? He said, yes. He said, my father burning in hell or not is my Lord's decision. But my Lord has also granted me the greatness of what? The great blessing that I split heaven and hell. Therefore, I think I'll look after my father with my intercession. Yes. That person that tried to come and mock Imam Ali. Imam Ali replied that Allah allows shafa'a. That revert in our community, her parents or his parents are not Muslim. Do you think that automatically your Lord will put them in hell because they're not? Wallahi, when you came towards Islam, part of it was your parents' blessings, believe you me. There are some, their parents are not Muslim, but believe you me, their patience and their respect to Islam is wonderful. Yes, You cannot turn around and say, because the parents are not Muslim, they'll burn automatically in hell. Someone asks, but the Quran itself says, in the and Allah al-Islam, the religion of, uh, with Allah is Islam. Therefore, how could you say non-Muslims will enter if Allah is saying that the religion is Islam? There's a difference in non-Muslims. There's a non-Muslim who the truth comes to, but blatantly rejects the truth out of arrogance and obstinacy. Yes? Why? They give excuses. I want to follow what my fathers followed, for example. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's problem with disbelievers is not that they've disbelieved. It's that they've stagnated in thought. And the lowest human being is the one whose thought has stagnated. Because sometimes people turn around and say, that Allah says the kafir will not enter. There is those who reject out of arrogance. There are those who reject because the true message has not come to them. Wallah, now I see in the media, ISIS beheading people on YouTube. I wouldn't become a Muslim. If my parents were not followers of Ahlul Bayt and I was brought up in this generation, I would not become a Muslim. And you know what some of our ulama say? If a person sees the wrong Islam, when they come to the day of judgment, Allah will make an exception for them because it was unfair that the wrong Islam came to them. Yes. Today you find, for example, even that we look at some of our brothers in other schools in Islam and we get mystified. Why don't these people know about Ahlul Bayt? Why don't they appreciate Ahlul Bayt? Who told you that they even were told about what we know? Do you know how many brothers and sisters out there in the world, Muslim brothers and sisters, they don't have a clue about the Battle of Jamal, for example. You tell them the Battle of Jamal, what happened? I don't know. Saqifa, what happened? I don't know. Some don't even know the difference between Hassan and Hussein. I'm telling you. And it's not something to smile about. It breaks the heart of the human being. That person is different from the one who's been told and arrogantly rejects. There are those who are told and they arrogantly reject. Then there are those, no. They were not even told. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will judge them himself. The judgment is not with me. I can't turn around to such people and say to them. Now, someone may ask a question. A non-Muslim is going to ask me, why should I become a Muslim if I'm a good human being? This is an important point. Please focus on it. I'm a Christian. I go to Africa. I help the poor. I go to India and I help the poor. Why then should I say, Ashadu anna Muhammad and Rasulullah? That's it? That's, that's what gets me into Jannah? Then that's a very narrow religion. Please listen to this delicate point. I want everybody to focus on this point. When my Christian friend asked me, why should I believe in Muhammad if I'm a good human being? I follow Christ, you follow Christ. I follow Moses, you follow Moses. I follow ethics, you follow ethics. What difference will it make with Muhammad? My reply is what? What do you have to lose following the path of Muhammad? Yes. 
Rasulullah's path is the path of those prophets of Allah that you admire yourself. Yes. Firstly, he says it himself. I have been sent for one reason. To complete the mission of the prophets who came before me. Yes. What was that mission? The mission of instilling the most sublime morals. Ibrahim is different to Rasulullah. Isa is different. Musa is different. My dear brother, my prophet himself says you cannot reach Allah without your prophets. Yes. Therefore, when my prophet is coming with his message, what have you got to lose following him and following his family and their sublime spirituality? Yes. Their sublime spirituality. You found that. Why do we say about Imam Al-Hussein? Assalamu alayka ya waritha Adam. Assalamu alayka ya waritha Nuh. Nabila. Assalamu alayka ya waritha Ibrahim. Khalil. Assalamu alayka ya waritha Musa. Assalamu alayka ya waritha Isa. Ask many people, what is this ziyara? Many will tell you, I've recited it for Thursday night. Every week I haven't got a clue what I'm reciting. It's called the ziyara of inheritance. Which inheritance? The inheritance of the ethos of the prophets that came before him. Yes. Aba Abdullah, when I tell a non-Muslim, what have you got to lose following Imam al Hussein alayhi salam? You're telling me that why should I convert to Islam? I'm telling you, you're a brilliant human being. You can become a greater human being with the message of Al Muhammad. Yes? When you're following Imam al Hussein, Imam al Hussein contradicted Abraham. Imam al Hussein went against Nuh. Imam al Hussein inherited the principles of those lines. When I come on a Thursday night, I say, Assalamu alaikum, Ya Waritha Adam, Ya Waritha Ibrahim, Ya Waritha Nuh. What am I saying? I'm saying Imam al Hussein is not some random Arab that popped out of nowhere. He is born from the mystical light of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Yes? Ashhadu annaka kunta nooran fil aslaab al shamikha wal arham al mutahara lam tunajiska al jahiliya bi anjasiha wa lam tulbiska min mudlahim mati thiyabiha. You found that I say, I swear you are a light in the purest wombs. Yes? Jahiliya never touches Al Muhammad. In the same way you want the purity of Jesus, I'm with you. I want the purity of Jesus. You want the purity of Moses, I'm with you. Come and meet the man who looked after the message in its essence of all those prophets that you admire. Yes? And that's why you find that that message of Imam Al-Hussein alayhi salam was a message where he wanted people to realize. If you don't believe in God and you don't fear the hereafter, then O oh, army of Abu Sufyan, at least be free human beings. You know when he said that line? While the arrows were all over his holy body. Yes. Which person says such a line? You know he had fallen off his horse. They wanted to know if he's dead or alive. And Shimr bin al-Joshan, what did he do? He said, attack his family, the woman. He'll never stay on the ground if his daughters or if his sisters are about to be attacked. He is all over the ground like a hedgehog, the narrator says. You've seen the hedgehog. What is the hedgehog? Spikes all over his body. And yet he stands up and he calls out to the army of Abu Sufyan. Oh, army of Abu Sufyan. Say you don't believe in God. You don't fear the hereafter. At least be free human beings. Stand up against oppression and tyranny. Look at what he said in that one moment. That's the meaning of Islam. That's religion. It's not the ends, it's the means to making you a free human being. That you want to die on this earth, die as someone who is the very embodiment of the meaning of freedom. Yes, and that's why you find that no doubt the moment he said that, there is already someone who was affected by his message. The only companion and the only commander in the army of Umar bin Sa'ad. But before that, who had got affected? You found, for example, Wahab al-Kalbi. Wahab was a Christian. Look how Ahl al-Bayt show Jannah is not just for the Muslim. No way. Wahab was a Christian. And his wife, they had just got married 17 days before Karbala. How many days? 17 days before Karbala. When Imam al-Hussein passed his house, his mom came out. What's your name? He said, Hussein, son of Ali. Where are you heading? We're standing against the tyranny of our time. And the narrations mentioned that Wahab, his mom tells him about Imam al-Hussein. That his principle is the principle of justice. He wants to stand up against justice. And the narrations mention that Wahab joins Imam al-Hussein. Wahab's a Christian. 
The army of Imam al-Hussein is not for Muslims. The message of Imam al-Hussein is not for Muslims. The message of his grandson, the Imam of our time, there is a hadith that says, those who claim to follow the Mahdi will be the first to leave him. And those who worship the sun and the moon will be the first to join him. Because those who follow the Mahdi now, arrogantly will say, we're the chosen. Whereas the one who worships the sun and the moon now, polytheist, atheist, their principle eventually may lead them to Imam al-Hujjah's army. Imam al Hussein did not say, Wahab, you're a Christian, you cannot join. Wahab, you want to come on the path of justice? Come, join us. And wallah, that story. You know, at the beginning, she didn't want him to fight. She didn't want him to fight. She looked towards him. She said to him, I beg you, don't go out and fight. Because it was his turn to go out and fight. And he replied back to her, I want to fight for this sake. This is a principle I have to uphold. We cannot let tyranny rise. Subhanallah, as he's leaving, again she calls out, I beg you don't go. I beg you come back. And again he continued. He said, so I have to go. On the third time, she said to him, go out and fight amongst the pure ones of Ahl Muhammad. He looked around towards his wife. He said to her, you told me not to go. What changed your mind? This line breaks the heart. She said, you know what changed my mind? I said, what? She said, I heard the cries of the children of Abba Abdullah. Al-Atash, Al-Atash, Al-Atash. The thirst, the thirst, the thirst is killing us, yes? Then after that, what was it? After that, he looked at her, he said, but what really changed your mind? She said, I turned around to the other direction. I saw Abba Abdullah standing by the tent alone. Calling out, Is there anyone out there to help us? And that broke her heart. You know, she went alongside her husband. She was killed by Shimr bin Diljoshan or his servant. When they took the head of Wahab, they threw it at his Christian mom. You know what his mom said? Took the head back, gave it back to Umar bin Sa'ad and Shimr bin Diljoshan. She said, I, had, I wish I had more sons to give Fatima's son. Allahu Akbar. That's freedom. That's when a mother is proud of her boy. She knows her boy may not have died on Islam or converted, but he died being a godly personality. A personality of ethics, a personality of principle. And that's why, subhanallah, how much Imam al Hussein said, die as a free human being? Who was called free on the 10th of Muharram? But Hur bin Yazid al-Riyahi, Allahu Akbar. Hur highlighted that just not his name, but rather even in his nature, he was Hur. Yes, this man had everything going for him. Warrior, the greatest of them in Kufa, commander of the armed forces. The world awaits him, but he felt, I'm not a free human being. This is not right. Even when he came to leading Salah, he said, Aba Abdullah, uh, Imam said, you lead us in Salah. He said, how can I lead and the son of Fatima is in front of us? A person like that is a godly human being, sometimes misguided. It takes something small to change his mind. After that, he came to Imam al-Hussein, can you give us some water? Imam said, of course, how can I bear to see you thirsty? He put his head down, it affected him. But you know if a person is not a believer in God, or they are a believer but not a Muslim, you know all Allah looks for? Reflection, one hour of reflection, greater than 70 years of worship. Hurb bin Yazid al-Riyahi reflected for one night. It made him loved by 300 million tonight. One night of reflection. One hour. One hour. Not taking the flow. One hour reflect. 300 million idolize him. Because that night, there were things that broke his heart. And on the morning of the 10th of Muharram, he realized, what have I done to the children of Fatima al-Zahra? I blocked them from the water. He overheard a conversation. There were three things that changed his mind. Some narration mentioned two. The first of them that changed his mind was which one? Was the moment he heard Umar bin Sa'ad said, I'm going to go and give water to my horse's hooves. Because my horses, their hooves cannot take the heat of Karbala. The tears began to flow from his eyes. He cares about the hooves of his horses. Well, I see a six-month-old baby crying. <laughs> and then further than that, what happened? He heard Shimr bin al saying, today the heads will be cut and the hands will be severed. 
When he heard that, he realized, that's what am I doing? How am I a free human being? Like my mother named me. She named me Hor the Free. But I am not free in this way. The narrations mention that he gathered his son Bukher. He gathered, gathered his servant. He turned around towards them. When he turned around towards them, he said to them, I've got to make a decision between this world and the hereafter, between heaven and hell. This is my moment now. Either I change, or I remain a slave to my desires. Subhanallah, he rode that horse of his. And they called out to him, Al-Muhajir called out to him, he said, if they told me who is the bravest man in Kufa, I'd say, Hur bin Yazid al-Riyahi, but I witness a change in your complexion. What are you doing? He said, I'm heading towards the army of the son of Rasulullah. Yes. When he headed towards the army of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, Abu al Fadl al Abbas came out. He was wondering, does this man want to attack us? Abu Abdullah said, Wait, Abbas, wait. Let me hear what he has to say to me. Look at the akhlaq of Abu Abdullah. Anybody else, if you block the water from their children, you'd attack that person. He said, Let me hear what he has to say. Har did not lift his head when he came to Imam al Hussein. He was ashamed. How dare I block water from the lips Rasulullah used to kiss, from the very cheeks that Rasulullah used to touch. He came towards Abu Abdullah. He came even closer to Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam. He said to him, Abu Abdullah, I beg you, forgive me for blocking the water from you. Listen to the reply of Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam. The Imam turned round to him and said. To him, oh, Hur, I want you to forgive me that you've come towards my army and I've got no water to give you as my guest. Allahu Akbar, the akhlaq of Imam al Hussein. At that moment, Hur said, Do you forgive me for blocking the water from your children? Imam al Hussein turned around and he said to him, Hur, you are forgiven, do not worry. At that moment, there was one more thing that Hur wanted to say, and I think all of of us understand what he's about to say. He said, Abba Abdullah, where is your sister Zainab? Show me Zainab, I beg you. Why? It's as if he could see the whips of Kufa and Sham because of him, yes? He began to blame himself. He said, Sayyidah Zainab, I beg you, forgive me and ask for forgiveness from the children. He turned around at that moment to Imam al Hussein. He said to him, Abba Abdullah, let me be the first to die in your way. He went out onto the battlefield. He said his famous lines, Inni an al hur wa ma'wa dhaif, adhribukum fi a'naqikum bis saif, an khayri man halla bil he fought valiantly until while lying on the ground he called out for the first time Assalamu alayka ya Abu Abdullah All of us ya Abu Abdullah let our final words be these words Why? Because all of us want to see Abu Abdullah when we die come towards us Imam al Hussein came near him You know what Abu Abdullah said to him? He said, Hur, verily you are like your mother named you, free in this world and free in the hereafter. You know what the narrations mention? He picked up the body of Hur, he returned back to the tent. Shortly after that, he picked up the body of Habib ibn Mawahir and he returned back to the tent. Shortly after that, he picked up the body of Wahab al Kalbi and he returned back to the tent. All of you know where I am heading now. When every companion of Imam al Hussein when they fell, Abu Abdullah carried their bodies back to the tent. I ask all of you who carried the body of Abu Abdullah when he lay on the ground. I ask you who picked up the pieces of the body of Imam al Hussein. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never show us what the horse has done to the body of the son of Fatima al Zahra. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to raise us with Muhammad and Al Muhammad. Ya Allah, raise us with the Imam of our time, Imam Sahib al Asr wa Zaman. With the tear that flows, recite your hajat, whatever you have deep inside you. With the tear for Abu Abdullah, recite your hajat. These are the nights when our du'as 
are accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And just maybe, just maybe, Zahra sits next to one of you listening to the masaib of her son. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all of our brothers. Ya Allah, bring peace and prosperity between the Muslims and the non-Muslims of this country. And allow it to be a country which continues to look after people with respect and with morality. Inshallah, we will begin our question and answer session in a few minutes. Let's all rise from Matam al Hussein. Ya Hussein. Rahimallahu man aada salata ala Muhammad.